Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. It took former cricketer Imran Khan two decades of hard political slog to win power in Pakistan. It has taken his critics just months to decide he's out of his depth. They point to the country's crippled economy, propped up by emergency loans, despite Imran's promise to end the begging bowl culture. Well, my guest today is Pakistan's finance minister, Assad Umar. Is the PTI government strong enough to put Pakistan on a new course? Asad Umar in Islamabad, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. You are one of the key ministers in Imran Khan's government. Why do you think the hope and excitement generated by Imran's election victory has worn off so very quickly? Actually, it hasn't. Uh, if you look at the Pakistani media and uh, listen to the political talk shows and maybe hear some of the discussions going on in the parliament, you might be led into believing what you just said. Uh, but in reality, you know, when the year, when the first 100 days of the government ended, there was a lot of focus, a number of surveys got carried out. And if you look at the surveys, a very clear majority of Pakistani thinks the country is moving in the right direction. It is, uh, it is uh, moving towards a place where it is better than where it was earlier. And hope is very much is in the air. The truth is the country isn't going in the direction that Imran promised for it. In fact, the press have taken to calling him Mr. U-Turn. He said, I will be ashamed to go abroad and ask for money. Well, the truth is that is precisely what he has been doing. Well, but the, by the time the government came in, it was a well-known fact that Pakistan needs some kind of a bailout. And I'm not saying that today. I said this repeatedly in interviews to print, even in international media before going into the elections. And it is not something to be proud of. So if he says, I'm ashamed of it, uh, you have to have pretty low self-respect to go around uh, doing what the Prime Minister of Pakistan, the Finance Minister of Pakistan have to do in the current circumstances and be proud of that fact. Uh, the, the real challenge is the real decision and that's how we will be judged in the future. Did we take the decisions of setting the country's economy on a path where this is going to be what I've repeatedly said, the last IMF program if we get into one right now. Uh, and for that, a very, very clear direction has been set. Uh, Pakistan has been using a growth strategy which is imported capital finance consumption led that has led us repeatedly into these current account deficit cycles it's taken our external indebtedness to a level with, which is not sustainable until we move pakistan to a domestic resource mobilized productivity led export oriented mm. economy we're not going to be uh, getting out of this begging ball syndrome and in the very first hundred days we have taken clear decisions oh. which are moving the country in that direction very interesting you say that minister but if one cuts through the economic jargon it seems to me that what you have done is sort out loans from those who are going to impose the least conditions upon those loans. You looked at the IMF at the very beginning. You wanted a big wadge of money from them. Some people said up to $12 billion. Then you realized there were going to be very, very serious conditions imposed upon it. So you cut the bid to $6 billion, and you haven't even agreed that. And instead, you've raced over to the Chinese and the Saudis and taken their money because they don't impose the same rigorous conditions. So you can't convince me that this is a new start for Pakistan. There are actually two different parts to that thing. First of all, the sequence of actions uh, is not exactly consistent with what you just said. When I became finance minister, I said we will be reaching out to friendly bilateral countries as well as starting a dialogue with IMF and we are going to do these things simultaneously because there is no time to first work out a strategy which is your preferred option. And that's exactly what we did. We start the, within 10 days of uh, becoming the finance minister, I reached out to IMF, invited that 
their team over uh, and that team did come in, a staff mission came in, they issued a report, we started a formal dialogue, uh, the mission was here in the month of November and that dialogue continues yeah, well, even today. <laughs> that's at all, the same that, time, that's at all the very same well, time, Minister, we but that's all very well and I understand hmm. these things aren't altogether simple but the bottom line is the IMF ties giving you up to six or seven billion US dollars, it ties it to some very serious reforms that you must make to stop living beyond your means, including hiking energy prices, for example. You don't want to do that. That's politically difficult, which seems to me why you're so tempted to take the money from Saudi Arabia, for example, where they're not imposing those kinds of conditions. If you, if you allowed me to complete my answer, you would have gotten the response to this part as well. That's what I said. There is a second part of it. And that is, we have not waited for IMF to impose any sanctions on us or impose, impose any conditions to, uh, on us to do what we think is required for the economy. In the very first 100 days, we have increased gas prices, we have increased electricity prices, we put in a supplementary finance budget where we increase taxes. We have been, the, the uh, policy rate has been increased by the central bank, uh, the rupee has been devalued, the currency has been adjusted by the uh, central bank. So both the monetary policy and the fiscal policy have been moving in the very direction of the reforms that are needed. We don't need IMF to dictate that to us for us to do that because we believe this is what's mm -hmm. necessary. However, the, the, the path for reform is uh, different in the eyes of the IMF as we stand today versus where what we think is right. And that's what the dialogue is going on right now. There is no difference of opinion in terms of what needs to be done. It is the pace, the ah. sequence and the extent which is being discussed. Well, the pace and the extent, they're, they're, they're pretty important differences, I, I, I would suggest. But, yeah. but you, you yeah. keep avoiding yeah. the references I keep making to your decision to take Saudi money. When everybody else around the world yeah. was utterly appalled and disgusted by what we saw happen in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul with the murder of the Saudi writer and journalist Jamal Khashoggi, the Pakistani government held its nose, decided to send top representation to that investment forum in Riyadh, and your Prime Minister Imran Khan himself went out of his way to say nice things about the Saudis, and as a result you got uh, an assistance package of around six billion dollars. When we talk about shame, should you not be ashamed for that? Well, I, I would be happy to be ashamed of standing up uh, with a country with whom I've had close bilateral relations and both countries which have supported each other over years. Uh, and, and I've never lectured on what kind of a system that country should hold. Maybe the Western leaders should be ashamed of themselves talking about democracy, talking about freedoms, and then reaching out into the same Saudi pockets to take out billions of dollars of, uh, of business deals, the leader of the Western world, the leader of the free world, Mr. Donald Trump, stands up and openly says, I'm getting too much business from Saudi Arabia for yeah. me to worry about what happened to Khashoggi. Believe so, me. so maybe, maybe some of the Western leaders should be ashamed of themselves. Now, we are just being consistent in a bilateral relationship which has remained the same regardless of who is in power. Finance Minister, I take your point about Donald Trump. If he was sitting in the hard talk chair today, believe me, I'd be discussing with him his values, the way he treats his relationship with Saudi Arabia. As it happens, I've got you in the chair. I come back to the point. You've taken, in the last month or two, $6 billion of assistance from Riyadh. That gives the Saudis real leverage over you, as I understand it. One of the conditions is that you send uh, some of your military personnel to work in Saudi Arabia. You say that they won't be fighting in Yemen, but they'll certainly be training the forces that do fight in Yemen. Is that a price that you, in all honesty, think is worth paying to just get yet more bailout money? The Pakistani relationship with Saudi Arabia goes back half a century. Uh, this is very interesting, Stephen. When I was born that day, my father, who was working in the Pakistan army at that point in time, was in Saudi Arabia. And, uh, and he had a meeting with the, the, the crown prince, who later became King Faisal, who gifted me a small Quran. So this is a relationship which goes back 50 years. It has got nothing to do with Khashoggi. It's got nothing to do with Yemen. Pakistani troops have been present in Saudi Arabia, and we've had a military relationship which spans half a century. And that relationship is not about to break uh, because we may agree or disagree with Saudi Arabia on how to handle the Yemen crisis. Thing is, if we 
move beyond Saudi Arabia to your relationship with China. I see yet more seeds of trouble being sown by your desperation to get your hands on foreign currency uh, to save your parlous uh, budget. The Chinese relationship involves a huge uh, investment from China in this CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Much of the money going into vast infrastructure pro projects in Balochistan. We know that many people in that very underdeveloped part of your country are furious about the impact the Chinese money and the Chinese labor is having on their particular region. Again, are you sure that all of the compromises you're making to get your hands on the cash are worth it? <laughs> I'm not sure which compromise you're referring to, but uh, Stephen, I thought foreign direct investment was something which is good. That's what I learned from uh, Western economic schools. That's what the, that's the economics it that I depends. was taught. It that all depends. FDI is it good and it should be sought. Minister, it all depends whose interest it's in. Who's got the leverage? Whose interest so, is it so, really serving? So, so, so the, what is supposed to be a good deal is where the interest of both the investor and the country in which the investment is taking place is served. Both their interests are served and that's exactly what is going on in CPEC. As far as a vast number of people in Balochistan being furious at what the Chinese are doing there, on our last visit to China, uh, when I went there with the Prime Minister, the Chief Minister of Balochistan, who is the elected Chief Minister of Balochistan, who represents the voice of the people of Balochistan, was with us and he was eager to have the Chinese engagement in Balochistan increase versus what it is right now. So I'm not sure which are these people who are furious over Chinese engagement in Balochistan. Why does your government not go public with all of the arrangements, the financial details behind China's loans and indeed investments in Pakistan, including rates of interest, labor terms and conditions, all of those things? Many people in Pakistan have asked you to be completely transparent about the nature of the deals you strike with the Chinese and the Pakistani government has always refused. That's actually not true. Uh, there are, if I divide it into two different parts, most of the investments which have come in have been in what are called the independent power projects, the IPPs the, which came in. And those are investments which are made under a transparent announced policy which the regulator puts into place. So those terms and conditions, you can go on the website right now and find out what the terms and conditions for those investments are. As far as the loans are concerned, the loans uh, information, there was a lot of mistrust. Uh, probably built around the media narrative which has been going around uh, when the IMF team came in. We shared all the details with them uh, as transparently as they wanted. After the first meeting, I didn't hear any questions from them because there is nothing to hide. Did you see the words not so long ago of Mike Pompeo, the US Secretary of State, when he was asked about his view and America's view of the IMF? helping Pakistan in the future. He said, make no mistake, we're going to watch what the IMF does very closely. There is no rationale for IMF dollars uh, associated with that American dollars being used to bail out Chinese bondholders or China itself. We'll wor worry about our China debt problem. Uh, Mr. Pompeo should worry about his China debt problem. The USA is the largest debtor in the world. Uh, to China, $1.3 trillion they owe. What, is, what does Pakistan owe to China? Less than 10% of Pakistan's uh, foreign debt is owned by the Chinese right now. 90% is non-Chinese. We have been into 12 different IMF programs in the last 30 years. Why has this question never been asked about which source or which country has lent how much to Pakistan? Why is this suddenly all this much interest in how much money has come from China? Why were the same questions not being asked when the lenders were Western banks? You tell me that uh, the Baluchi people are thrilled that China is putting so much money and infrastructure in, into their region. It's a little embarrassing, isn't it, when, as quite recently in the port city, Gwadar, there, that you're trying to develop as a new mega port to be at the end of this sort of uh, Chinese transportation infrastructure through uh, the region. It's a little embarrassing. At the time, you were taking delegates, I believe, from more than 20 countries to look at the, the, the potential of all of these projects. Gunmen shot dead three workers, injured five others, and that was the fourth fatal shooting in the area. 
in just a few short months. The security situation, the, the degree of insecurity around that region and the anger that I've referred to that is generated among some by what is happening, that's a real threat to stability in Balochistan. This is, this is not anger of the people of Balochistan. Uh, these are activities of sponsored terrorists who receive training, funding, material from outside Pakistan. And is there a serious attempt to try and destabilize uh, uh, Balochistan and through that try and uh, subvert CPEC? Of course there is. There is a concerted who, effort to do who, that. Who, who, who's uh, there doing is, that? So, so there is no disagreement there. Who's doing uh, that but in, your, what do in, the, your, what do the, in your opinion? Who is doing that? These external forces? Led by, led, led, led by India, of course. So is there terrorist intervention in Balochistan? Absolutely, yes. What the people of Balochistan thought, uh, that has been expressed through the free will of those people by electing a government of Balochistan which stands by CPEC, which wants greater engagement of CPEC in their province. Let's talk about the big picture in Pakistan. Uh, Imran Khan came to power, you became finance minister, promising uh, a, a new era of fairness in your country where every individual Pakistani would get a fair shake. Uh, the situation today is that 45% of children under the age of five show signs of undernourishment and stunted growth. You have some of the worst education figures in all of South Asia and at the very same time only 800,000 Pakistanis out of a population of more than 200 million pay any significant tax. If you are to change that situation, it is going to require the most massive thoroughgoing reform. Those are the very reforms that we have been working on despite the severe balance of payment crisis. Uh, the revenue generation aspect is absolutely central to be able to deal with the horrendous challenges that we have. You're absolutely right about that. The health situation, the education situation needs drastic reform. For that, you need revenue. For that, you need the revenue uh, authority fix. So what are the, some of the things that we have already done? We have separated uh, tax policy from tax administration, which is absolutely central to the reform effort. The, almost the entire top leadership of that revenue authority has been changed. We have made changes in law which allow the application of modern technology, use of data analytics, algorithms, to figure out where tax evasion is taking place, who is uh, evading taxes, to be able to go after them. We have developed these list of high net worth individuals who are evading taxes. 3,100 of them have already been issued notices and the follow-up is being done. The database is more than 700,000. But we wanted to first pick on the big ones, make them an example and then expand the net. So, and, and I can go but, on with 10 other well, initiatives which have been it's taken as a result of this. It's interesting you alight upon tax evasion and of course that's one element of, of uh, an accountable, transparent system of governance. Another way of looking at that is the, looking at the state of the media and the right to free expression. Uh, Imran Khan and your government are accused by the Committee to Protect Journalists in, in a statement released recently of aiding and abetting a situation in your country where the Pakistani army has, quote, quietly but effectively set restrictions on reporting, lines of control which effectively gag the media. In the interests of open and transparent governance, you personally must be fighting that, are you? The need for Pakistani democracy is a is a media which is free to express its opinion and get the facts to the people of Pakistan. We as Democrats uh, have a vested interest in a, in a, in a free media. You don't, so have, there, you there's don't absolutely have a free no media. About that. You have journalists who are being that, disappeared by shadowy intelligence agencies. You have a, uh, a, an can, opposition can, party can you, leader who is saying me? our country is today mm -hmm. under the grip of a silent martial law. That's, that's very nice, nice and dandy for the opposition leader to say that. But if in the last three and a half months you can mention the name of a single uh, journalist who has disappeared or come under any kind of a threat, I'd, I'd be happy to know because I would like to stand up for that journalist. Uh, the, the, the need for free media is absolutely paramount. The government of Imran Khan, the Tariq e Saab government stands by that responsibility. There is a need for bringing some kind of accountability into this whole space of media and social media so that people cannot 
spread false information, but that cannot be made an excuse for gagging pe people's expression of right. Uh, well, uh, the right of uh, freedom of expression. All you have to do, Stephen, is watch one evening of television and you'll find out how free the media is, how right. the government gets just, ripped into and criticized. On, on that point, I just recommend you talk to the veteran and respected journalist Ghazi Salahuddin, who said recently he's lived through the dictatorship of General Zia, but he says right now is one of the worst times I've ever seen for journalists. We get threats phone calls we've seen journalists being disappeared we see an atmosphere of fear and self-censorship so if you want to know what's happening in the Pakistani media today maybe you should speak to him I will I'll be happy to speak to him and know him very well I have a lot of respect for him uh, but with due respect to Ghazi Salahuddin then he's forgotten what happened in Zaira journalists were in jail they were tortured they were public flogging of journalists so uh, with all due respect uh, maybe he's starting to, uh, his memory is starting to fade and he doesn't remember what was going on there. But that should be no benchmark. We should not be saying that we are better than. All right. I stand for freedom of media as yep. much as Ghazi Salahuddin does and I'll be happy to make that phone call to him. And if you stand for a, a free, well-governed Pakistan, very different from what we've seen in the past where extremism doesn't triumph, how worried are you that Imran Khan has completely failed to stand up for the rights of Asya Bibi since she was released from prison. Of course, the Supreme Court said that she should be released after she'd languished in prison for so many years in a blasphemy case, which the court ultimately dismissed, and yet she has not been allowed to leave the country. How disgusted are you, as a minister in the government, by your own government's failure to protect her rights? Imran Khan's government believes in rule of law and the supremacy of the law. We believe in the tricameral system of justice. The courts decided what was the right decision. It is not for the government to decide, and the government stood by that decision. Uh, so, so putting any kind of a blame on the government on either the release of uh, Asia Bibi or her lack of travel abroad, neither of these decisions were taken by the government of Pakistan. So you can neither give us any credit nor any discredit for that. We well, believe I, that these are decisions for, me, for the it's courts not for me to take. To be and whatever out, the decision I'm that is taken, I'm not doling out the credit or the discredits. I'm listening to human rights activists like Sherry <laughs> Raymond, who said Asia Bibi is still suffering pr profoundly despite her acquittal. Imran Khan has lost all credibility. He cannot make decisions to uphold the rule of law. His politics revolves around religion and U-turns. Things really haven't changed very maybe much we, at all, have they? Maybe Sherry Rahman has not heard about the fact that those who created a law and order situation after that, uh, instead after that decision was taken, who destroyed public property, who issued threatening uh, statements, are facing accountability perhaps for the first time in decades in Pakistan. Maybe this change has not uh, yet been informed to Mr. Uh, Ms. Sherry Rahman. Uh, I, I would strongly suggest that she should go through the newspapers of the last few weeks and she'll find out what is happening is truly unprecedented in the last 30 years of Pakistan. Let, let's end with a personal note, if we may, Minister. You know that uh, there are countries in the West that have offered safe haven to Asya Bibi. Would you, as a human being, and never mind your loyalty to the government, whatever, but just at, on a most human and personal level, would you like to see Asya Bibi allowed to leave Pakistan and make a new life for herself in a safe third country? I would like every citizen of Pakistan to be able to live freely and safely if they chose to do so in Pakistan, for them to do so in Pakistan, and if uh, they want to live abroad, for them to live abroad. Uh, but these decisions on whether the uh, something which is not yet fully decided by the Supreme Court, a final decision on appeal has not been taken. Whether the travel freedom should be allowed or not is a decision for the court to take and only for the court to take. Minister Asad Umar, I thank you very much indeed for being on Hard Talk.